Um, what we're really going to focus on today's uh, conversation is uh, really look at identifying trends um, in the space of allowing companies and organizations to collaborate both externally and internally and identify some of those barriers internally and externally that is stopping the transition um, to a circular economy and or enabling it. Uh, we're really super lucky today to have two North Stars. I think what we're always looking in the space right now are is leadership and examples of organizations that are really leading and spearheading the change on the transformation to a circular economy. Um, and we're very lucky to have two of those panelists with today. So I'm really looking forward to, to diving in on that. Just a couple of programming notes while we're getting set up. Um, you'll see in the chat box, um, both the organizations, uh, Katrina Shum, uh, who represents Lush, and then Vivian Luke, who's the executive director of work and works uh, with First Mile Thread, you're going to see um, two articles that are already in the, in the discussion of what those organizations have written on their transition to a circular economy that recently came out in a Pixera Global's paradigm shift. So I encourage you to click on those links, digest it, and read the great work that they're doing um, after this conversation. Um, while we're still working on getting some um, um, pieces worked out, just to set the table on the enabling environment, um, we're going to look at it, first of all, from a corporation point of view of a company leading a transformation into the circular economy space. Um, and then we're going to look at it from the other side. So a company working on leading the transformation to a circular economy space um, and the internal barriers that they have to overcome consistently to be circular. Then we're going to transition um, over to the nonprofit side and work with uh, Vivian Luke and, and go through the point of what it takes oh. to work with corporate partners okay. on their transition to a circular economy. Okay. So it looks like we're almost ready to go here. We're almost there. Katrina, you're, you're hiding here a little bit. Can you say hi? Hi, sorry, this is weird. It's a IR camera apparently. I don't know. Seems to go in and out. I apologize. Well, I think what we can do as we have good audio, um, we can try to move forward with the chat, try to have okay. a conversation. If your if your wonderful face pops up, we'll be great to see you. Does, does that make sense for everybody? That's great. Great. And and by the way, Katrina, you're not alone. This is the new world. It's tech. We've all been there. Everybody's nodding their head, going, "Been there, done that, get it." So, on that note, let's jump in and really have an engaging conversation now. We have just 25 minutes for this conversation moving forward. So here's the agenda of how we're gonna move forward. We're gonna jump in, first of all, with a brief Q&A with the participants. It'll last 12 minutes. And then we're gonna turn it over to you folks to ask some really engaging questions. What I request is that if you have questions already that you're kind of thinking of, just pop them in the chat. I'll go through it. I'll look while, the, while um, uh, Katrina and Vivian are answering the questions and then we can come back. So just make sure. Um, that that's the case. So let's dive in. I'd like to first start off here and dump in if we can and talk about um, the role of the corporate sector on the transformation to a circular economy. As we mentioned earlier, I think what's lacking in the space is we have few companies that are really embedding circular all through their value chain, externally, internally. And I think the, or, the, the world is looking for a North Star. So Katrina, no pressure to put you as that North Star, no pressure whatsoever. But maybe you could provide a little context, Katrina, on Lush itself, a little bit of the organization, and a little bit of history of your transformation into a circular company. For sure. I apologize, I can't have the video, but um, yeah, a little bit of background on Lush. And I won't answer for Katrina, so we'll wait for those technical difficulties to, to maybe come through. Um, Katrina, if you're there, say hi. If not, we can wait for you to come on and I'll transition to Viv. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Okay, so a little bit of background on Lush. Um, we are a global cosmetic brand. Um, we operate in 49 countries, uh, about 25 years old, and are privately held and family owned. Um, our founders are based in the UK, and they are also actually our product inventors. Um, and a little bit of, I guess, history on their roots. We started by inventing products um, back in the day with upcycled drain pipes and lunch pails. 
And these are kind of what continued um, to where we are today on that idea of how do we kind of reuse and upcycle. Uh, for us here in North America, we're a vertically integrated business. Um, in North America, we have salmon manufacturing facilities and distribution facilities and 250 retail shops. Um, sorry, I'm having a little hard time. I'm getting a lot of hearing an echo of myself. So it's just a little bit hard. Um, I don't know if it's sitting on my side. Okay, I guess I keep going with it. Um, yeah, so we have really ethics at the core of our business, um, and naked is one of those core values. Um, over the recent years, we've really expanded our line. Uh, sorry, I'm really, really hard hearing it. I'm going to put myself on mute in case that helps. Okay, let me, that would be great. Okay, perfect. Uh, I still hear it. That's okay. No worries. Um, yeah, so we, um, I'm trying to see where I was at. I think I covered more of it. Maybe I'm sorry about that. This is a little bit distracting. I think one of the other things that I can mention just in terms of um, evolving our product line so that we have naked products that require no packaging at all is really the work that we've done around um, incorporating recycled content, um, post-consumer recycled content into our packaging for um, over 10 years really. And one of the big programs that we've um, started around circularity is around our Black Pot Return program, which also started over 10 years ago, where we collect Black Pots back from our customers um, in exchange for a free face mask. And haven't really heavily promoted that program, but get approximately 17% return rate on that. Um, and so each new black pot is made with about 10% resin from our old black pots. Is that a good enough summary to start us? Thank you, Katrina, for that. Really appreciate the context, and 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 it's amazing. I'm just about Lush's, Lush's journey. Um, on that note now, I want to transition to another North Star, uh, Vivian Luke, Executive Director of War. Um, talk a little bit, Vivian, if you can, about your work in the space, your work working with the private sector specifically. Um, and I think one thing that's really interesting about you folks is that you know, you're working with some really wonderful and amazing people that are rather marginalized in the world, waste pickers. Really talk about your role of working with waste pickers, representing that marginalized group, and then some of the tension and barriers that you have working with the private sector on their transition to circularity. Yeah, thanks for having me today, John. Uh, Katrina, it's good to see, to see you um, <laughs> here on the call as well. Uh, so I'm the executive director at work, and our organization works to end poverty through good, dignified jobs. Um, we're one part of a uh, partnership um, between sister company Thread, uh, where we create an initiative called the First Mile uh, to bring full transparency to the first mile of recycling supply chains. Um, so we work in Haiti, Honduras, and in Taiwan with a collection network of about 2,000 uh, waste collectors uh, throughout the all three countries. Um, they're part of the informal network uh, economy in, in the local setting. Um, and uh, together, we, uh, we've worked to do a number of things in, in those three supply chains. We've assessed those supply chains uh, for their, their potentials for the ability uh, for us to deliver uh, plastic material to uh, consumers. We've provided recommendations to address some of the issues, technical challenges and sustainability gaps that we saw um, when we first started the work there. Um, we've also implemented strategic programming to support the waste collectors efforts to build their capacity um, locally to ensure that they have a dignified work um, uh, coming out of working in recycling. Uh, and then finally, we measure the work that we do uh, with key metrics that starts with the people, um, understanding what their needs are and what the challenges that they face are, and then 
building those programs behind uh, what they're uh, what they've essentially told us that they need, um, and then measuring to make sure that we are actually doing what is it that we committed uh, to to doing to doing with them. Um, along the way, uh, this means that a lot of plastics also being collected. So over the last ten years or so, we've collected uh, over a million, hundred million uh, plastic bottles off the waste streams in, in all three countries, um, and have inserted them into the supply chains of about fourteen different brand partners that we work with. Um, these include uh, HP, um, who have uh, incorporated the material into their monitors, their laptops, um, their ink cartridges. Um, they've also uh, um, put, they put uh, added a $2 million investment into one of our local recycling lines that is currently being installed, which is really exciting to see. Um, CPI Card Group, um, every, uh, they have a, a line of cards, uh, credit cards, that they, um, they, uh, that they partner with institu financial institutions that are made from ocean-bound plastic from our supply chains. Um, Puma, um, their first uh, uh, running line that was launched last year was made from plastic from our supply chain as well, and, and many, many other brands. Um, so we, we really work in that connection space between the waste collectors networks on the ground, um, the recyclers, and then large brands who have in their goals to utilize recycled plastic um, into their packaging, into their consumer goods, um, whatever it is that, that, they, that they need it for. Um, and as those goals, many of these companies, large CPG brands, apparel brands, are starting to have very ambitious goals uh, around utilizing recycled content. You know, we want to make sure that our waste collectors are best positioned um, to, make, to, to, to be a part of the supply chain, to lead in the supply chain um, and not just uh, be at the very bottom of the chain, uh, you know. And so there's a lot of work in building up their leadership, but also making sure that they're fully engaged in the supply chain. And this is where with companies like HP and CPI and Puma, we have not just worked with their sustainability and procurement departments, we're also working with their strategic philanthropy. Uh, making sure that their philanthropic gifts are aligned with the work that they're doing in the supply chains. We're working with marketing and sales as well to make sure that the word, uh, the, the stories um, that are taking place in the first mile supply chains are being highlighted to their consumers. Um, and, you know, what's great is that some of these companies that we work with, like Lush, has these types of sustainability values baked into their, to their company from day one. And that's where we think that most companies need to head towards in order to really fully engage in this type of work. And somebody asked in, in the chat, you know, who, who, needs to get, who needs to get involved in, in this scenario? I would say all departments. And it has to come from uh, by, with, with critical buy-in from C-suite as well. You know, that, that's a great point. I mean, I think one of the trends we've been seeing recently is, you know, I had a friend recently that was head of CSR for a company, and next day his, his title changed to head of SEG, ESG, excuse me, stakeholder relations. He had no background in ESG. Um, I think that you're seeing a shift in companies' behaviors, especially around the circular economy. And I think you make a really good point of talking about that transition where it needs to be in through a company's entire internal value chain all the way through. Um, what I want to do now is, since we have 15 minutes left, I want to make sure that the audience um, really can, can engage on some questions and then I can come back to you with some other questions moving forward. So what I'm going to do now is I see a couple of, of audience members in here. I'm going to click on them and let them ask their question. If you're clicked on, if you please could just do a quick favor, your name, the question, um, and then uh, who is it directed to, Vivian or Katrina. So here we go. Let's give this a shot and see if our tech holds up. Christelle Westerlaken. I messed that name up, I'm sure. Hi, Christelle. did is we tried to do it that way. We're going to move forward and we're going to go back to the chat and just take questions that way. So I'm going to go here from Soli Shin. Um, she says that Lush has done a great job on spending upfront dollars on better quality products. Um, how can other brands learn to accept these risks and embrace long-term returns? Really good question. Um, Katrina, I'll turn this over to you. What are your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, that is a really good question. I do think it has a lot to do with the culture of the organization. I think one thing that we have talked a lot about at Lush is that we, to your point, we'd rather put the money into the products than the packaging that goes around it. Um, and I think it does take a mind shift in the organization if that isn't part of your DNA to begin with. Um, I think fortunate for us, it was part of our DNA. Our founders believe in it. And so, you know, even in the work that we've done in recent years and um, reformulating products to take water out of it um, so we can get solid versions of products that require no packaging, that really comes from the top of the organization. Um, so I think if you, as an organization, aren't necessarily coming from that space, then it does take a bigger shift. And I think a big thing that I know we've realized is just the change in what consumers are asking for. Um, we have so many customers um, who who are so well informed, who challenge us even on our practices um, and have suggestions or help us to kind of push our own thinking around what we can do. So I think that, you know, whether by choice or whether by pressure for, for customers, I think that case of what the customer wants um, and is looking for can help hopefully shift some of the, the narrative that companies are having internally around the more sustainable options. Uh, thank you for that answer, Katrina. Really helpful. Viv, um, I see a good question here for you that I really want to ask you, and I think a lot of people would be interested in. Who manages? So when you look at working with waste pickers, right? I mean, waste pickers, the informal economy, um, all over, all over the world. Who manages waste pickers? How does that look? So when you do a project, let's say you're working with HP in Haiti, who's responsible for managing the waste pickers? their work they're, they're doing, making sure that they're ensuring it, bringing it in and you have enough um, plastic that can be used. And then number two, how are they incentivized? Um, how are they rewarded both from a project that you're working on, but also maybe give a little context of how they're rewarded, if they're rewarded or if they're taken care of outside of that project. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, what's, what's great about this work is that um, Years ago, when we first started in Haiti, you would see plastic bottles all over the the, the land, the the grounds, the waste streams, the um, the riverways, and um, you know the the minute we were able to put an economic incentive on it, uh, they started to be collected. Um, and you know these are uh, in Haiti uh, specifically, the network is informal, so um, we've got about uh, fourteen hundred people who are collecting, uh, some full time, some part time. Um, we have moms who are you know collecting for a couple bucks a day to put food on the table uh, for their kids um, while their husbands are at work. Um, we have um, we have. Uh, um, networks of, uh, of entrepreneurs who are collecting full-time who have also built businesses on their own, what we call collection centers, that have hired another uh, five to ten other full-time workers to, to support their work, um, to do the sorting process, to, do, uh, to remove labels, um, to prepare the bottles for, uh, for sale uh, to a recycling company. Um, so the, the network is informal. They, they manage themselves. Um, we work directly with them uh, to coordinate capacity building efforts to to build up the leadership um, to also offer uh, the connection between them and uh, recycle the recycling companies and the brands um, and so you know uh, what's great is that um, the 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 economy itself um, really helps to to uh, manage how they move forward with the work so um, you know when if 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 prices for PET is low, for example, they might turn to metals. Um, if prices for um, PET is great, they might also collect a lot more PET at any given moment. Um, depending on how uh, the transportation system works in the countries too, you're also getting uh, various types of collectors involved in that network as well. Hope that answers the question. That's a tough question. That's a hard question. Thank you for answering it. Really appreciate it. Um, I want to work, move a little towards toward, to Lush again um, with a question that's not in the chat, but, but I think is kind of relevant. I think what you're seeing, you know, in the space, Viv, you mentioned that you work with, with Puma and, and taking plastic and sourcing it for ocean plastic. Um, you're seeing other companies in that space. Reebok, they have a plant-based shoe. Nike has moved to their zero, zero shoe. And then you have Adidas, of course, with the ocean plastic shoe as well. Um, Katrina, when, when you see the space, especially in the cosmetic space, 
Um, you see companies that are really getting the circular from an upcycling context, at least, or, or creating products out of plastic and put into market space. Um, they look at their competitive set. Um, it's more of a differentiator. Do you view your circular economy platform as a differentiator for you folks in the cosmetics and beauty industry? Do you view that that's one of the key ingredients for your success is the fact that you're targeting a certain customer or that is something of value, you're saving money? How does that speak to you when you, when you look at your, your industry itself? Yeah, I do think it is. I think, like I said, I think sustainability, circularity, naked products with no packaging, um, that has always been core to who we are and what has set us apart as a business within the cosmetic space. I think we've seen, and rightfully so, our competitors catching up with us in that space. Um, and again, it comes back to customers demanding it and asking for it, um, which is what's kind of fuels our our kind of work on how do we continue to push this and what does that look like um, so that we can continue to differentiate ourselves. Um, and so that has led to stuff that we looked at, as I mentioned, in terms of reformulating products. So it's not just solid shampoo bars, but it's solid lotions and solid um, serums and solid toothpaste and all these things that you know we've traditionally relied on packaging for, but that we can start to change the dialogue. Um, one of our our founder's son in the UK talks about kind of keystone species within a larger kind of ecosystem. Um, and we're kind of that, right? We're a really small a player within the larger cosmetic space, but we see our role as how can we be that catalyst for change to kind of start this transition for teens around the world um, and inspire other both customers and companies to, to relook at, at how your traditional bathroom routine is. Um, and so I think that is a lot of the work that we've been doing externally. I think we've also done a lot internally that we haven't really spoken about, but looking at circularity up, upstream in our supply chain. And I've done a lot of work on working with our suppliers on reuse of their packaging. So like a box reuse program, other types of packaging with our local suppliers around our factories to, again, push the envelope upstream um, with those players around how do we rethink waste and reuse and upcycling, um, not just downstream with customers, but upstream as well. Thank you, Katrina, for the great answer. Really appreciate the context. Um, we're we're rough, running short here. We have about six more minutes. So Viv, um, there's been some really good feedback or questions to your feedback that you gave. Instead of me just reading one out and reading a list, how about you choose the question that you want to answer in that feedback loop and um, go ahead. If you could just read the question out loud and then answer it, that would be great. And then I have one more question for you both to take us home. Yeah, I uh, juiced. I'll answer your question about how I've been network manages itself. How do we prevent things like child labor? Um, that's a great question. Um, and I, uh, I, you know, what we what we do do is implement formal programming in the supply chain. And that comes from the initial assessment that we do in, in each of the supply chains to look at what are the issues that we are seeing that we can address through formal programming. So in Haiti, for example, we have a program to, to end child labor. Um, and it, it, it is taking, uh, working with the children who are in the landfill who have to work on a day-to-day -to, -day to survive um, to uh, put our wraparound service model I uh, implement our wraparound service model with them. Um, so what, what they're now doing is going to school every day. They have access to medical care through our programming. Um, their parents are also in our program to learn life skills and professional development uh, so that they can get a job that allows them to take care of their children instead of having their kids work. Um, so we it, that initial assessment is very important to us um, because it then allows us to figure out what is it that this network actually needs in order for them to continue to move forward and grow uh, their, their work and the deliverable in the supply chain. Thank you for that, Viv. Thank you for the answer. Thanks for the context. I mean, you know, that that's a really in, a unique intersection that you're at is that you're really bridging the gap of, you know, this this disparate population. There's so many great things and are so, so vital, I think, to many of the country, countries' economies that you're working with and the fact that you're connecting those dots, really inspiring. One last question for you both to take you home. So we have four minutes. So Katrina, I'm going to go with you first and foremost. Um, you both have been in this space for a while. You both been in the circular economy space and, and being leaders. Um, and I think will be really helpful um, for the entire 
um, audience to know is if you have to give one maximum two key tips to success in the circular economy um, within the context of partnerships, whether that's internal or external, what are those two tips that you can provide to take home um, that they can take with them when they go on their circular journey wherever they may, may land? So Katrina, we'll, we'll start with you on that question. Hmm, that's a very good question. I would say, I'd say one big thing is really um, collaboration and connecting the dots between all the stakeholders, both internally and externally. I don't know if that's really one tip or two tips, but I think that's been the key thing for us as we've made transitions in different programs and working with different suppliers and building out our relationships with different partners through the value chain when it comes to circularity. It's not just, you know, it's how do the, how do the pots get back to our or to our facilities, it's who's processing and grinding it, who's, you know, extruding it into new black pots, what does that look like in manufacturing, how do we educate our shops um, so that our staff are, are talking about that, so that our customers understand, so it's really, I think, being able to clearly understand all the players throughout the entire loop and what their actual um, incentive is to get involved and what their responsibilities are and help to connect those together. I don't know if that's one or two answers, but for the short time, I would say that's the big piece for us, especially being a vertically integrated company. We have that opportunity to kind of connect those dots internally and externally with the partners that we work with. That's great. Uh, and I'll build on that. Um, for us, you know, I would say that uh, keep in mind that every part of the supply chain is human powered um, and that there are people at stake at every 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 step of the way. Um, you know, for the fact that waste collectors um, have not been talked about, included in any of these conversations for a long time, um, until very recently, is uh, it's something for us to reflect on and to make sure that any conversation that deals with supply chains has to include the people who are involved in them. Um, and then to that end, for companies that, you know, what, what, where we see really strong partnerships and real authentic um, outcomes are driven by companies who have long-term commitment to these supply chains, offload agreements, making sure they understand the economics that drive these supply chains and drive the, the people behind it. It's incredibly important and figuring out how to tap into that. Um, so, you know, we, uh, we're we able to do what we do today and, and end child labor for so many people in the supply chain because it's because groups like HP have committed for multiple years with us and will continue to commit along with us, not just with the, the volume that they are that they started with, but that but with growing volume um, of materials that they're purchasing through the supply chain, along with strategic giving. Thank you. So Vivian and Katrina, thank you so much for sharing your insights. Um, and uh, we look forward to continue engaging. Everyone, you can check out the respective websites. Um, and I just want to thank you all for joining and, and give a really sh a large shout out to Circularity and Green Biz for the great work they've done in competing and put this together. So thank you, everyone. Please connect on LinkedIn. Have a great day and look forward to continuing the conversation and seeing you in the future. Take care, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thanks, John. Thanks. Thank, you. thank you.